Adam and Eve sponsoring this video with half off and free shipping on one item. Watch to the end for me to have fun with this. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the worst two years of my life. Your life so far. The worst two years of my life feel like just two slightly longer years away from the previous worst two years of everyone else's life during the Great Recession of 2008, in which the housing market collapsed but the video game market didn't, and that led to a lot of gaming media outlets proudly declaring the video game industry as recession-proof. But since people are actually permanently dying this time, the current pandemic recession is going to make a housing market recession pale in comparison. But video games being recession-proof still seems like a thing that's going to ring true. I'm losing my marbles, I feel like a big old duffel bag of shit, but I'm going to try and look on the bright side of things here and highlight at least three... Ironically positive changes since 2020. Like Sonic fans getting their first good news in decades, Sonic the Hedgehog was the sixth most highest grossing movie for that whole year. When the pandemic was first really, really getting bad in late February of 2020, gaming media was in a panic, largely because of the unprecedented challenge of what to do in the wake of canceling almost every large in-person event, trade show, convention, or expo the industry had to offer. That's never happened before. A frenzied editorial by Time Magazine declared, The coronavirus is wrecking havoc on the video game industry, with much of that alarm focusing on supply chain issues expected to stunt the launch of an incoming new generation of consoles, but also especially the cancellation of that year's GDC. Hotshot Vlambeer indie dev quote mine Rami Ismail is quoted saying, This is quite a blow. This might be career ending. But what ended up happening instead is that the game industry has beginning a, let's say, booster for the rest of the whole pandemic. But not in a way people were predicting back when it was early, and a lot of that has to do with efforts made by Ismail himself to fill the gap. A colossal consequential computer chip shortage has indeed stunted manufacturing just as they predicted. No one can buy themselves a PS5 or a decent PC graphics card, and oh no, you gotta wait one whole year for that highly anticipated big budget AAA sequel to come out. The Final Fantasy concert I was supposed to go to yesterday got cancelled, and so did all the live trade shows for the actual professionals too. But if you look at most any sales coverage or quarterly report coming out of the game industry over the past two years, numbers are actually getting higher? Sales increased 20%? It seems like generally across the board things are actually performing above expectation and more people are getting into games for the first time ever? It feels like there's a contradiction going on here, but really it's deconsolidation going on here. More money is getting piped into the video game industry than before, but in smaller drips, through smaller projects, from smaller companies, to more fragmented audiences that are more concerned about casual accessibility and cross-platform playability and... adorability. A whole new audience has gotten into gaming to connect with others online and feel a little more comfy and normal because they can't do either of those in person right now. Back in 2020, after GDC's cancellation, we saw a lot of online-only showcase events fill that gap, such as Rami Ismail's own GameDev.World. The biggest reason why GDC or Gamescom getting cancelled is still gonna remain a hard blow to the heart of developers is that those events are a venue where big business deals happen, and a lot of smaller projects find investors, but on the consumer's end of the equation, that kind of loss has been borderline invisible. The kind of advertising that filters a game's publicity out to the normies is not the kind of advertising that smaller games get from those trade shows. What ended up happening instead is that all the normies really, really got into Animal Crossing. The Call of Duties, the Battlefields, and the Far Cries kind of flopped this year. If you're only counting those done-to-death AAA sequel games, 2021 would have felt like one of the most barren release schedules we've seen in decades. But what ended up happening is that smaller projects stole that spotlight instead. The New Yorker of all rags managed to put together a top 23 list of games to play this year that were specifically made not by the biggest companies exposed for having a culture of workplace harassment. This deconsolidation away from AAA titles towards smaller ones isn't just cultural, but reflected by real sales data too. It's maybe best seen on charts tracking the top digital sales this year, where back catalog games from two to five years ago take the top 10 spots. Resident Evil Village is the only one on here that's actually a new release. 
And yet, despite that contradiction, industry-wide revenue has still been increasing, just as it has in every year in memory. Thanks to how this time, that number is no longer being driven by console-exclusive AAAs for consoles you can't buy. So instead of even feeling the temptation to get a PS5, everyone's been begging me to play Loop Hero and Inscription instead. But actually, my two favorite games of this year were The Forgotten City and Cruelty Squad, and both of those got virtually none of that traditional advertising, and they were both made at home by small teams last year throughout the panic and uncertainty of 2020. Much like Snoop Dogg's Twitch channel, the video game industry was uniquely poised to take advantage of the digital nature of its labor processes to transition to a work-at-home environment. Back in 2020, when lockdown orders were first rolling in, big studios flipped the switch and reversed the typical dynamics. For one study looking at Canada in particular, large studios saw 97% of their staff going from working in an office to 100% working at home. IDOS Montreal went the extra mile and converted to a four-day work week, according to the official publicity at least. But whether or not this is totally a good thing depends on who you ask and where. This isn't a dynamic seen in a lot of Japanese studios who've still maintained their usual office environment. It's mostly a thing that happened in the Western world where the case counts are so much higher and where everyone wasn't already accustomed to wearing face masks out in public. A UK study by UK researchers, Yuki, reported that game makers maintained 80 to 90% productivity during this switch with no declining revenues, but the Canadian Entertainment Software Association report says that 60% of their companies have seen a drop in productivity. Uh, have you found working from home to be more or less productive than back in the office? Oh god, so much more productive, and I am not speaking for the industry. I'm speaking probably for, for a cohort of people who share my personal dispositions, which I know from, you know, a, a lot of friends in the industry. I, I don't know, maybe it's like 25% are just like me, 25% are on the other end of the bell curve and most are somewhere in the middle. But for me personally, being able to define my own workspace, my own work time, my own work environment, uh, when and how I interact with people is hugely, um, I don't know, it, it allows me to feel the freedom that I think I need to do the best that I can. Look at that, I'm doing journalism again. It, it's this nesting instinct that takes place over the course of months. I've seen my coworkers kind of catch up with where I was after uh, working at Moon for so long. Well, there's two things that you wanna do with a nest. You wanna make it comfortable and, and like your normal work environment, but you also wanna be able to switch it off and turn it into different things, which are like, when, when I built this whole like Muppety setup with the grassy background, I particularly have it so like I could be streaming and that's my my night job. And then when it's my day job, I put my mythical logo up there and now I'm at work. <laughs> yeah, that, that's your home so, office. <laughs> the company sign. Yep, exactly. Yeah. There is this perennial battle in every game studio between the artists and the producers, more or less. Uh, artists always want it pitch black and the producers always want all the fluorescent lights on at full blast. Um, and so the beauty of working at home is there is no conflict. It is just whatever I want it to be. It's not all positives. Negative quotes about switching to a work from home environment often mention the loss of detailed communication that comes from casual in-person connections. Respawn's Chad Grenier said, You lose the hallway conversations. You lose the people sitting on a couch and discussing something for an hour or two. You miss the lunch conversations. Since video games is a combination of tech jobs and creative jobs, a loss in those conversations may lead to a loss in new creative ideas. And ironically, without even knowing these quotes ahead of time, Josh Foreman said almost exactly the same thing. Yeah, the number one complaint about not being in the office is just the water cooler conversations, the, the random bumping into each other, the overhearing two coworkers talking about a system and realizing, oh, wait, they don't realize X, you know, and you run over and, and it gets kind of corrected that way. So um, in that case, I would say if delays, if we are slowed down at all, it's due to that. There's also a lot of hope that working from home will help prevent one of the game industry's most famous mismanagement problems, crunch time. You know, I've come to the understanding after 26 years in this industry that crunch is a natural phenomenon that will happen unless actively opposed by leadership. 
I have plenty of friends who work at you know Microsoft and Bungie and other places where crunch is pretty normal. And um, I get the sense that there is still a lot of unrealistic expectations that are still driving uh, churn at those companies that I, I think crunch is a big part of churn in the larger companies. And I don't see that slowing down at them. So churn, um, uh, churn meaning, you know, you work there, you get burnt out, you quit and go somewhere else. Avoiding crunch time is one of the most highly publicized infamous problems facing the infamously stubborn upper managers who are so often blamed for high turnover rates and toxic company cultures. But the most unflattering reckoning facing AAA gaming this year was only barely related to the actual pandemic. Hundreds of workers leaving after reports, investigations, walkouts, and unionization efforts triggered by a culture of sexual harassment found out from so many game studios. One of the most ironic, most poetically positive byproducts of all of this, the pandemic, the scandals, the working from home transition, is that wages have gotten a bump up just to keep so many workers from leaving out of disgust. Another depressingly ironic positive byproduct of stubborn managers reckoning with the reality of selling luxurious electronic entertainment to an audience making life or death decisions is fighting games got way better netcode. There's gonna be nothing shy of absolute pandemic that will cause a change in mentality here, you know? They know that people are rejecting these things outright these days, and they realize that they have to follow suit despite the fact that they're reluctantly doing so, begrudgingly in some cases it feels like. Um, but when other Japanese studios that they can talk to implement it, then they feel a little more comfortable following suit. Wooly Madden is an expert fighting gamer who's probably the only one you haven't heard of who wears a fursuit. Over 2020, he was planning to tour through a bunch of live events until he gradually watched them dry up from cancellations, just like the rest of all the big gaming conventions. Since then, the online infrastructure filling up that gap has been the adoption of Rollback Netcode, which has become a real activist cause among the fighting game community. Rollback Netcode predicts and distributes packets of each player's input data in a way that won't pause the game to interrupt anyone's super complicated quarter circle ultra combos if any of those packets get lost in the middle of the input. Instead, they're filled in with predictive formulas based on the game's design and flow. It's an old solution to an only slightly older problem, dating back to around 2007 when the piece of middleware, GGPO, figured all this out. But since then, the biggest Japanese fighting game companies have been stubbornly resisting this software, playing right into what is typically characterized as an infamously stubborn Japanese corporate culture. Since the fighting game genre is mostly spearheaded by Japanese developers working with Japanese internet infrastructure where the distances between players are never going to reach as wide a gap as they do for international audiences, the traditional delay-based netcode that works in Japan but doesn't elsewhere has typically been seen as their most affordable solution. To some small degree, I believe that the existence of uh, the way arcades are set up in Japan actually contributed to uh, furthering delay-based netcode, which is the bad one. This is something that Western developers are just, they're more, they're paying attention to because we feel it more over here. This was the way things worked until the pandemic canceled in-person fighting game events in both the East and the West, leaving online play as the audience's only option to experience these games the way they're meant to be played. Nowadays, implementing rollback netcode is a matter of a game's commercial success or failure. You just, there's just no turning back the clock on this, you know? Um, it was more just that online was a neglected feature. It didn't matter as much. It really just, it wasn't thought about. Now you cannot, you cannot ignore it. And your game might come out and immediately die if it doesn't have it. In the past two years, tons of old fighting games have gotten netcode updates with rollback, along with tons of new fighting games you wouldn't exactly expect to have this stuff. KOF 98, Rivals of Aether, Street Fighter V, Samurai Showdown, KOF 15, Melty Blood, Nickelodeon All-Stars Brawl. BlazBlue saw its user count increase 3,000% after this. Are you worried that things might go back to the way they were before? 
Not at all. Uh, I don't think this is a temporary thing. Um, this is a... Uh, the, the push for rollback net code has been, again, uh, 13 years in the making, 14 at, at, at this point. Um, and it has been something that is, it's not a matter of, uh, this is a preference that happens to be what we need for now. It's simply a, a superior version of net code and internet based like matchmaking. Like it's a superior version to the, the existing ones that we had before. In conclusion, every few decades, you see one or two years where 13 to 14 years worth of stuff happens all at once. And somehow, I don't think I'm unique for being pretty generally depressed about all that. For the past couple years, I've been feeling like a miserable loser. I've lived an isolated lifestyle, I've been socially distanced and hopeless about the future. Things that should be bringing me joy just don't cut it anymore. Until my George told me about AdamandEve.com with the code BUNNYHOP. AdamandEve.com is your number one online adult toy store, and with this deal they're offering 50% off one item plus free shipping in the US and Canada. Now, with AdamandEve.com with the code BUNNYHUB, I'm no longer staying awake at night wondering about what's going to happen to me next year. AdamandEve.com with the code BUNNYHOP is not for everyone. AdamandEve.com with the code BUNNYHOP is not approved by any medical organization. Do not drive or operate heavy machinery while using AdamandEve.com with the code BUNNYHOP. If you experience stiff muscles, high blood pressure, or an erection lasting longer than four hours, then talk to your doctors. These conditions could become permanent. Dizziness or fainting may occur upon standing, which is a real side effect of real antidepressant commercials. And since 20% of their profits go to fighting AIDS, I no longer have to worry about my karmic influence on the universe either. AdamandEve.com with the code BUNNYHOP has made a difference!